Again, for those joining us uh, in the last couple of minutes, um, we'll be having a question and answer session at the end. And I invite you to um, share your thoughts and uh, invite some perspectives about what you heard. And please uh, use the chat feature to ask any questions. Um, my name is Gene Techmeister. I'm a physiatrist here, assistant professor of the Department of Orthopedics at Keck Medicine and the Spine Center. Um, my co-host here today is Zori Booser, who's a PhD science extraordinaire um, at the our spine department that has been instrumental in developing literature and evidence-based medicine uh, for use by many, many people and some recent publications and some um, other great work that uh, she's not only doing now, has done in the past, but hopefully continue to do so in the future. Um, she'll be um, the um, second part of the presentation. Um, I'll start off with a quick introduction, um, which I want to start off now in regards to what the Spine Center is, what we are all about at USC. And uh, uh, again, I welcome you to ask any questions and uh, formulate any discussion or concerns at all. Um, well, again, welcome to Innovations and Advances in Spine Care um, presented by the USC Spine Center. Um, I'd like to introduce you to my fellow colleagues. Our fearless leaders are all the way to the right, Dr. John Liu and Dr. Jeffrey Long. Um, myself, Dr. Arnellis and Dr. Chang, our physiatrists, interventional physiatrists, and um, are trained in non-operative techniques. And we have an array of very talented orthopedic and uh, neurosurgeon uh, spine specialists that are here as a multidisciplinary team, which leads me to the next slide, because you can't do this alone. Um, between the surgeons, the physicians, the rehabilitation specialists, we have a great physical therapy department, as well as occupational therapists, inpatient medicine, uh, spine me uh, hospitalists that all work together for optimal patient outcomes. And I think that's the best way to do it in terms of getting people back, especially with spine issues. Um, you now, again, just we're all in this together, both for patients, for ourselves, and uh, we can't do it alone. Um, spine surgery obviously is a focus uh, just because of the sheer number of pathologies that do occur, some being more severe than others. Um, but I do want to stress that this is not the primary focus. The primary focus is patient-centered care, whether that be uh, spinal surgery, whether that be interventional and medical spine care, uh, utilizing non-interventional, interventional, non-surgical non techniques for both diagnosis and treatment, the advanced technology that is available at a major institution uh, such as USC is absolutely uh, mind-boggling between robotics and um, guidances, uh, MIS, uh, which is minimally invasive surgery. Um, some of uh, the specialties and our specialists are um, more than capable, have been leaders in publications and uh, teaching around the world. Uh, mission statement is to be recognized worldwide as a leading academic spine center, state-of-the-art patient care, spine education for the next generation for surgeons and innovative spine research. We are based out of Keck Hospital, which is downtown. We also have an outpost um, and a sister or location at Verduga Hills Hospital. We have multiple outpatient associate departments. Um, I'm currently based out of uh, largely El Segundo, which is in partnership with the Toyota Sports Center and the LA Kings in combination with the uh, Center for Sports and the Epstein Family Foundation um, and their generous give grants that allowed this facility, being the Toyota Spine Center in El Segundo, um, to uh, exist. Um, and 30% of personally my practice and uh, a lot of USC has been telemedicine. There's a lot what you can do in order to save miles, save copay, save uh, gas, and still be able to get the care you need um, virtually from the comfort of your home. Um, we have an orthopedic surgery residency. We have a neurosurgical residency, surgical spine fellowship with admits two every year. We have a medical spine fellowship that is led by Dr. Chris Arnellis. Um, we have medical students, visiting students, 
you name it, and we take education seriously, both na nationally, locally, as well as internationally. Um, you can see some of our esteemed faculty, Dr. Lou, Dr. Sh uh, Shea, and Dr. Wong presenting uh, in multiple conferences in and around the world. Um, between our visiting professorships and relationships, um, we can kind of do it all. And uh, research, which is somewhat going to be a little bit of focus today. We've heard uh, Zori, uh, Dr. Bruser speak about um, some other uh, research last webinar. And uh, even now, I think it has to be part of what we consider on a day-to-day -day basis in order to be able to help patients um, with everything that we do. So what I'm gonna do is gonna start my presentation. I see a couple of uh, people joined in, so please uh, use the chat feature for any questions, uh, and then we'll uh, have a little bit more of an in-depth discussion a little bit later after both uh, presentations have been finished. Uh, I'm going to be uh, speaking on regenerative treatment for options for spine conditions, uh, focusing on non-surgical and interventional techniques. Uh, disclosures, uh, nothing relevant to this talk, um, here are my other disclosures. Um, we'll talk about uh, regulatory affairs. We're going to talk about a little bit of our basic sciences, current evidence, uh, indications for regenerative targets, and then a literature review of what is currently out there uh, to guide appropriate clinical care. Um, low back pain and why we care. It is the leading cause of disability worldwide. Um, it is pervasive. It is found everywhere. It, in past lectures that I've done, you ask people to raise their hands who've had back pain, and obviously the majority will raise their hand. So it's something that affects everybody and uh, absolutely is important as far as trying to figure out an optimal way of treating. Uh, as far as costs alone, we're talking about $100 billion in uh, spending on musculoskeletal care with the majority of it coming from neck and back pain. Uh, it is the third and fourth largest uh, healthcare cost among disease categories from 1996 to 2013, and it has absolutely grown since that time. Uh, I've been in practice since 2013 for the last seven years, and I'm getting busier and busier without even trying. And um, it's important to understand why and how the biomechanics of low back pain occur, but we're going to save that for a different talk and what the targets are. Today, we're focused on regenerative options. So what can we and what cannot we do according to the FDA. So we are allowed to use autologous stem cells. We are allowed to use different products of blood, such as platelet-rich plasma, platelet-poor plasma, allografts, and such. We cannot culture. We cannot take the cells out. We cannot sort, purify, add enzymes. And we cannot really use amniotic fluid, although there's a lot of marketing for the use of amniotic stem cells. There really isn't a large number of stem cells in the amniotic fluid and it's too much of an early precursor. In order for it to something to be considered, not to consider be a regulated drug, it must be autologous and no more than minimal manipulation. This was a recent release by the FDA, Title 21, Code 1271, about the use of human tissues. Um, cannot enzymatic cleave it, you cannot add to it, uh, can add calcium or other additives in order to activate, quote unquote, the precursors that will make healing possible. Um, so we just have to be very weary of what is advertised and what is allowed to be performed given the clinical setting we're in. So how and why do we think regenerative options are an option for treatment of not only low back pain, but other musculoskeletal disorders. And we have to look at the natural healing cascade. And we have initial acute inflammation, collagen accumulation starts off within the first couple of days. And we have remodeling and matrix formation. So understanding how the body functions allows us to manipulate that response in order to obtain the most optimal outcomes in patients. So how does it all start between the cells and the different types of uh, bodily availabilities? Well, we start obviously with inflammation and injury and aggregation of platelets in going into scar formation, cross-linking matrix formation. And now, can we cheat this process? Can we speed up this process? Can we take what the body's given us and accelerate that healing? We all know that things get better. Uh, my old mentor used to joke around saying that hurry up and fix them before they get better. So how do we do that? How do we hurry up and fix things? Um, 
most things are self-limiting, obviously, in back pain. If you look at a lot of the disc pathology literature, most cases are going to be self-limiting. It's only a small subset of cases that do require significant intervention. Not to say that that doesn't cause disability in that large population, but can we facilitate that population that does not require a significant intervention to get better faster in order to reduce the burden that back pain, disability, and cost has in healthcare? Um, just a quick overview about what a hospitable environment is for uh, platelet aggravation, growth factors, creating a scaffolding with all the cells that are around. There's a lot of moving pieces that we have to be cognizant of when we talk about orthobiologics and regenerative treatments. It's, it's not just stem cells. It really isn't. Stem cells play such a small part of what everything is there that it is not the only thing that's important to understand when you're talking about regenerative treatments. I'm not going to go into detail about all of this. Just know that there's so much involved in order to be making appropriate tissue and tissue that remodels into tissue that's going to be effective in the functional improvement where we're talking about pathologies. So what is orthobiologics? I mentioned orthobiologics, which some of you may or may not know. We all know regenerative treatments and stem cells and platelet-rich plasma. Um, orthobiologics is a generic term that encompasses substances to promote musculoskeletal healing derived from tissues that are naturally found in the body. Platelet-rich plasma, stem cells, platelet lysate, et cetera, things like that, that we think can in concentration lead to an improved healing response. Um, stem cells can be derived from bone marrow, from fat. Uh, bone marrow can be taken as whole or concentrated. Um, fat can be mechanically separated, but not enzymatically. Traditionally, fat uh, stem cells have been harvested from the periumbilical area where the highest source of stem cells uh, in non-bone marrow regions has been located. Um, you know, there is some evidence for PRP benefit um, with disc annular tears and discogenic back pain. I'm kind of giving you a sneak peek of a little bit later in the talk, but overall the evidence shows us that it's a lot better in discs than it is in joints, than it is in the epidural space, than it is in the soft tissues. There's some decent evidence for PRP use in knee and hip OA. Uh, tendinopathy is probably where PRP has shown the greatest benefit. We're talking about lateral, lateral elbow epicondylosis, gluteus medius, patellar tendons, Achilles tendinopathies. We know that it's not inflammatory. We know the tendons aren't inflamed. There's micro trauma that occurs with aberrant neurovascularization and other pathological uh, events that lead to pain. So PRP has been very good um, in achieving that result. Uh, amniotic tissues, I don't really have a lot of evidence for. They've been used in wound care and tendinopathy, but the growth factors are dead. The studies are very limited. And at this point in time, because it is not your own body's tissues, it really isn't allowed by the FDA if you look at some of the recent releases. What is PRP? PRP is platelet-rich plasma. Ideally, you want to have a concentration five to six times that of normal. Your normal count of thrombocytes usually are in about a 220,000 range. So if you get something that is concentrating these platelets five to six times, and for some of the studies, if you get that million platelet mark in concentrations, what really you're striving for when you're talking about platelet-rich plasma injections. Uh, when you separate uh, platelet-rich uh, plasma or when you separate whole blood, uh, when you centrifugate it, what you get is the red blood cells on the bottom. You get this platelet puffy coat. You get the white spells and the plasma. Um, there is a difference between leukocyte-rich and leukocyte-poor preparations and some devices and some um, processing uh, equipment it defers in that. Um, there's a little bit of a pain less effect if you lose leukocyte poor preparations. There is some slight evidence to show that certain pathologies may benefit from the presence of white blood cells in there. But overall, you really want to uh, focus on getting the best concentration, the best concentration of platelets that you could possibly have in a small volume as necessary. Uh, really filtering out the red blood cells. Um, the proposed mechanism is modulation of infl uh, inflammation, uh, the potential to promote a healing environment, uh, activating, attracting mesenchymal stem cells, and initiating the body's own repair process, which has gone awry, obviously, with especially, as you see here, pictured intradiscal pathologies. <clears throat> um, in vitro studies um, have shown to produce down regulation of 
inflammatory molecules, thereby reducing the inflammatory cascade and generating uh, and attenuating some hyperalgesic functions. <clears throat> Bone marrow aspirates, usually taken from the iliac crest, uh, don't always look like the picture on the top right. However, um, not really sure as far as what you actually get out of it. There are some culture stem cell trials we'll talk about, and they theoretically can contain stump stem cells and red blood cells, uh, but how that stem cell is going to be processed in order to get to the structure that you actually wanted to replace is the question that we all have, and we're not really sure how that's going to happen. Um, fat aspirate, briefly mentioned, the peri-umbilical area can be done with liposuction, usually in the peri-umbilical area. You can separate it mechanically, usually centrifugation, and then enzymatic digestion is no longer allowed. Some studies have shown potentially higher yields of mesenchymal stem cells by molar marrow. However, um, you know, the bone marrow aspect, having some red blood cells to quote unquote activate the product uh, may be beneficial in that regard. Um, quick note about mesenchymal stem cells, pluripotent, multipotent, and, you know, differentiation in musculoskeletal tissue and bone cartilage uh, often is a question of can this be become uh, tumorgenic? Can there be excessive growth? And I think we're um, trying to learn about that as much as we can in order to promote the best possible environment without causing any side effects or, or complications. Um, really limited uh, clinical studies. They do modulate some inflammatory response, can be immunosuppressive as well, um, and bacteriostatic in addition to um, some of the regenerative capacity. Um, the benefit may or may not be from direct regeneration. Um, is it reconstitution of tissues from the native cells? Is it an activation? There's so much depth and complexity into producing this anti-inflammatory effect producing regeneration that um, I don't think we're there yet in completely understanding how this would function in the musculoskeletal standpoint, but there is some evidence that it actually does help. So let's talk about it. Um, really quick, just so you know, when I perform uh, PRP uh, procedures, patients are not allowed to take NSAIDs one week prior to the procedure and for 30 days. The whole point is not to inhibit biological factors such as you see here. We really want to promote PRP in doing what it needs to do. And we can't really do that if um, anti-inflammatories are present because it kind of counteracts a lot of the processes. Um, it's essential that we do what is appropriate. Uh, tissue development, regeneration, healing mechanisms, optimal preparations, all of this is absolutely, absolutely vital when we talk about performing regenerative treatments. Appropriate cell source needs to be considered. The mechanism for, for therapeutic effects needs to be considered. As efficacy, safety, controls, all of this has to be in place when you're performing regenerative procedures in order to optimize patient outcomes. So what are we trying to achieve when we're talking about regenerative treatments? Well, we have the intervertebral disc as a target. We have the zygopapazeal joint, which is your facet joints. So there's a hinge joints in the spine that allow for mobility and flexion ex extension and rotation, maintaining stability and security of the spinal canal. We're trying to reduce pain, improve function. In the epidural space, we're trying to minimize etiology due to neurocompression if we are having radiated pain or sciatica type of symptoms. So what's the evidence? Uh, there was a great review published in 2019 by Navani et al. And it looked at what is the evidence behind the use of biologic in spine conditions? And these are the four common injections that are most commonly performed in an in in interventional office, looking at the most common targets for pain etiologies. We have epidural injections for radicular pain, addressing nerve root pathology. We have facet injections or renal branch box or radio frequency, addressing facet pathology, SI joint injections for sacroiliac pain and lumbar disc injections for discogenic pathology, which is a huge source of axial low back pain, especially in the younger generation. 
So how did they break down the evidence? Just a quick review. Level one, multiple randomized control studies is effective, is a proven treatment, all the way down to consensus-based and limited level four and level five options, where there's some evidence, but nobody's really sure how much of it is real and how much of it is not, is underpowered and overpowered. So let's start with lumbar epidural steroid injections. Right now, there's only one randomized, double-blind reference control study that has evaluated Epidurally Administered Biologics for the Treatment of Radicular Pain. That was published in 2007. I know it's hard to believe, but it's not very easy to do a randomized controlled study using epidural injections. Number one, it, what is the gold standard? So are you comparing it to steroids? Are you comparing it to anesthetic? There's still some debate how much steroids are effective for lumbar radicular pain. Is it the flushing out effect of the chemical mediators There is the effective dose? Is it the steroid? Is it the anesthetic? If you just use saline, is it just good enough? Um, and there is some evidence here that shows that uh, autologous condition serum is what they used, um, does show consistent pattern of superiority over steroids with regards to visual analog scale. We know that steroid injections are not forever. They're not a treatment that will lead to significantly imp improvement in appearance of greater graphically evident radicular pain syndromes. But we do know that it can provide short enough term relief until the body does regenerate the disc or begin the healing process. If we could get the patient through the symptomatic phase, a lot of lumbar radicular pain is self-limiting. And that's what steroid injections are most uh, benefit in is in that acute phase to lower the uh, symptoms, allow the patient to return to a functional uh, state, physical therapy, rehabilitation protocols, activity modification, home exercise program, a multidisciplinary trope to treat those patients. So multiple observation studies, but again, not a lot of good evidence to show that stem cells, PRPs, or even regenerative medicine uh, is effective uh, in uh, radicular uh, pathologies. As far as lumbar facet injections, again, very low evidence as well. My thinking when looking at evidence for lumbar facet injections and regenerative treatments is why. We have a very good treatment for facet pain for spondylitic disease, that being medial branch blocks. It is evidence-based, it is validated. We know we can get years of relief from a radiofrequency ablation if we have a positive diagnostic block. So do we really need to regenerate uh, these facet joints where most people get great relief with other treatment possibilities. Maybe, maybe not. If there is a cost effectiveness to doing regenerative treatments with minimizing future care, maybe that would be a great uh, thing to look at. But at this point in time, with such a breadth of evidence that shows us that medial branch blocks and radial frequency are a great validated treatment, um, why would we consider intraarticular uh, agents as an option. Um, you know, this one randomized study did look at steroid injections for intraarticular facet preparations. However, we do know that intraarticular facet injections of steroid aren't the best treatment option. So just wanted to throw it in there as well. For SI joint injections, again, very low evidence for PRP. There is some evidence from prolotherapy, which I did not include in this talk, um, just because when you're talking about prolotherapy, you're talking about addressing multiple structures, LPSI joint, both the ligaments and the posterior elements. There's a question of innervation to the SI joint. How much innervation of the SI joint is posterior versus anterior? Uh, you know, if you de-innervate the posterior elements like you do with radio frequency of the SI joint, patients only get about 60, 50% of relief. Now that's great as far as a functional improvement, but where's the other innervation coming from? So that's one of the other thoughts that you have to uh, remind yourself of when you're talking about SI joint pain and where it's coming from. Uh, at the three-month mark, especially this study, that has similar outcomes to SI joint injections. And I think there are a lot of other better treatment options out there than even the steroid injection for SI joint pain, especially long-term. Certainly for refractive syndromes and pain that's really limiting, it could be a useful tool of minimizing symptoms. Um, Going to get into intradiscal treatments, which is the breadth of the discussion here when you talk about regenerative treatments of the lower back, just because we have the best evidence for intradiscal treatments. Um, right now, it's a level three recommendation from the study that I had quoted before, where a lot of the regenerative treatments have been aimed into the intradiscal uh, area. It is the holy grail of spine medicine. Axial low back pain is, again, 
very, very common. Is it joint? Is it disc? Younger people are getting disc herniations, annular disc tears, and we just don't have a good treatment for disc pathology. You know, if there's a herniation and there's an impingement on the nerve root, we could certainly calm those symptoms down. If there's facet pathology, we could certainly perform a meteor branch block. But if there's discal pain, we really don't have any good treatment options. And I think that's why PRP and regenerative treatment options offer this potential. You know, most of the US studies reported similar results to those found in vitro. There's down regulation of cytokines, uh, consistent and well-defined in vitro results um, are positive overall. So the question is, is it pain relief or is it healing? Um, I don't really know if we're conclusively able to define that and differentiate that at this time. Um, certainly some great studies, a lot more randomized control studies that were performed on the intradiscal side of it than the other pathology or the other uh, points of a target. Uh, one of the most uh, popular ones is the Levi and Akeda, looking at intradiscal platelet-rich plasma, autologously performed to treat discogenic low back pain. We've had 50% improvement, that's 47% improvement, almost 50%. Uh, we had 57% improvement, at 60%. Um, and it shows that continued safety, pain function at even two years post-procedure. Um, you know, the Navani et al. systematic review I mentioned before gave it fair evidence for intradiscal injections of PRP. Out of all the regenerative treatment targets, the intradiscal uh, space or the disc itself has received the best evidence out of all of them. Um, you know, a more recent study in 2019 showed that it was a safe and effective in reducing back, uh, back pain. Um, we see the PRP has a consistent analgesic effect. Is this effect greater than other therapies? Well, that's a really good rhetorical question because we don't have any other therapies looking at intradiscal pain. Um, there's the intracept procedure, for example, which is um, radio frequency of the basal tibial nerves and the end plates. Are you treating discogenic back pain there? Are you treating something else? So there's not really a lot to compare it to because there's really not a lot out there. You know, looking at uh, some more literature here, we have a treatment satisfaction rate that is pretty positive. We have statistically significant improvements of PRP injections. This was double blind uh, and at eight weeks, the improvements are still maintained. And from some of the other studies I've seen, that's certainly true even further out. Uh, intradiscal treatment, um, I believe, or some version of a blood product can or will be developed to help injured tissues heal. In the right patient at the right time, the right treatment may be a trial of intradiscal PRP um, because it does have that potential to actually help. I think most important is selection, technique, and the PRP preparation. Not every PRP preparation is the same. Some concentrated two to three times baseline, some concentrated even more, and I think that's vital to know as well. Um, prospective outcome study, again, showing more than 50% decrease in visual analog scales. Um, you know, there are two additional publications with two or three year outcomes um, that show well-defined outcome measures that certainly are promising. As far as the cultured uh, cell trials, there have been um, several. There was a case of disguises in the mesoblast study, no other significant safety issues, but again, we see improvements of greater than 50% that seems to be consistent across the board, whether they're cultured or in vitro cells. So in summary, the non-cultured mesenchymal stem cells of BMAC, which is the bone marrow aspirate concentrate, lack the preclinical and clinical data. However, there is potential and there is promise based on what uh, we've seen so far, both in the clinical and the research setting. However, I think we're not quite there yet to have this be a uh, everyday uh, treatment that's available. I think we'd still need to have a little bit more or a lot more evidence in, in terms of preparation, in terms of technique, in terms of best environment for healing and post-op protocols. A lot more work needs to be done in order to optimize patient recovery. Um, back pain, pervasive, significant resources that are spent on treatment. The, the evidence is weak, but it's promising. It is relatively low risk. It's antibacteriostatic. It's autologous, no significant risk or side effect complications other than the procedural aspect of it. And with the absence of any other effective treatment options for intradiscal pain, I think this may be something that in the future, uh, again, a little bit too early to tell, but can be uh, you know, the everyday treatment for 
low back pain. So just want to you can to consider to be ethical, consider the research, educate the patients. Um, stem cells aren't everything and for everybody. Um, and above all, just make sure you continue to exercise as my daughter here is doing a weighted sit up like mommy and daddy. Um, so just make sure you continue to stay active. And the best thing I can tell you as far as a piece of advice is do everything you can to prevent the need for any kind of intervention. Um, because that's what's going to be most important. It's not that strong core, which most people say, it's that it's the proper bracing and activation. It's the fatigue resistance in the core and the abdominals and the lumbar spine that is most important for low back pain uh, prophylaxis. And uh, with that, I'm going to hand it off to my wonderful colleague, and she will continue to tell you a little bit more about what we have in store for regenerative treatments. Thanks, Jane. Stop share. Excellent. And then she'll be up. Yep. And again, if um, any of you have questions, please feel free to use the chat. I'll be here um, jotting those down and uh, maybe even responding to some um, as we go on. Yep. Thanks, Jim. Um, I also want to thank everyone for joining us today in our uh, Spine Center series. And we will continue in the same direction as Dr. Techmeister, just look now from the surgical perspective. And what we've seen from the previous talk, there are a lot of different procedures, a lot of biologics, so it gets confusing. And it's a very similar situation when it comes to spine fusion and osteobiologics. So the goal for this talk is really to cover uh, different biologics where we stand uh, look at it globally. So look at the costs, uh, look at the evidence and the use. So hopefully uh, we'll achieve that and you'll gain that knowledge within the next 20 minutes. Here are my conflict uh, disclosures, really no conflict for this current talk. I do have to mention that I have consultancy with therapeutics. They are producing one of the biologics that will be discussed in this talk, but not part of our study. It's just the published uh, literature. So as I mentioned, when we think about osteobiologics, we have to look at the global perspective and look at the spinal market. So spinal implants are growing and in the next four years, it's estimated that they will be, there will be an increase in over 20 billion. And biologics itself, it's 2.6 billion uh, within next uh, two years. So what's driving that uh, large growth? Well, there are several, several items. One is the preference of use, the type of a biologic. And definitely when it comes to spine fusion, if we are thinking about open versus MIS, uh, plays a big role ease of use, then definitely we want good fusion, especially in challenged patients where, which have different comorbidities or maybe multi-level procedure. And then unfortunately there are also sometimes incentives uh, for certain uh, biologics then we know that there is an increase in population and uh, elderly, specifically elderly population, and several reports have looked at the increase over several next decades in over 60 years of age population, and you can see this uh, large uh, growth over the next 80 years. And then there is a sales force that definitely plays an impact when it comes to osteobiologics. And I'm sure that everyone saw this Wall Street Journal a few months ago when Johnson & Johnson had to pay large sum over uh, their surgical device marketing. So definitely different factors play a role, but most importantly, it's important to know what will fuse, provide the best fusion rates, and also improve patient outcomes, not only on the short, but long run, so that hopefully they don't need the revision. So another thing to consider, obviously, with the increase in number of spinal fusion and use of biologics, is which biologics are used most, or what's the breakdown. And what you can see here, I think this is from 2000 and end of 2009, 19, you can see that obviously allograft makes the majority with the DBM, and cellular allografts are 16%, growth factors, which is probably the uh, BMP, 21, and then synthetics and few minor. So really the main players are DBM, cellular uh, growth factors, and uh, synthetics. And we did um, studies, so when we look at the costs, 
Uh, this is the data that we did with Lumeres, and data was generated from around 300 hospitals on median costs of various biologics and different uh, uh, volumes of these biologics. So this is the cost, and it goes from the largest size to the smallest. These are the costs of uh, 10 to 1 cc of cell-based osteobiologics. Then this is the BMP2. Uh, uh, this is a small peptide P15, various DBMs. This is just the pool of various DBMs. And then the second graph represents different synthetics, some first generation, and then there is here a second generation bioglass. So you can see a huge disparity. Unfortunately, I don't have standard deviations here, but you can see huge disparity between different biologics. And the first question that I always look for is, is this supported with evidence? Because obviously if you're using something in large volumes, we have to have good evidence that justifies the use and the need uh, for this. So that's the next segment of the talk is really to look at the biology of spine fusion and the evidence for various osteobiologics. So just quickly in a few seconds, Biology of spine fusion, it's a long process. There are different uh, stages, starting with inflammation and going all the way through remodeling. Usually people consider this within a year. It's longer than a year, and especially if a patient is an elderly person or a smoker or has other risk factors, definitely will take more time. So, and But for all those segments, starting from inflammation all the way to remodeling, we need that bi osteobiologic to help and carry the process. So the only one uh, biologic that can do all that is obviously, as we know, autograft. And it's been heavily used and it's still used. There are certain limitations to it. Some people argue with the harvest, but definitely patient age comorbidities play a an important role, especially when we think about elderly populations that are getting spinal fusion. So in the past few decades, there was a large um, uh, process in developing new uh, uh, biologics that can replace autograft. And that's done. Uh, the most common are, as we mentioned through the cost slides, BMP, DBM synthetics. BMA has been extensively used, bone marrow aspirates on collagen sponge. And obviously BMP and BMA are important for osteoinduction. They have osteoinductive properties where DBMs and synthetics are more of a matrix structure and having osteoconductive properties. Uh, with the development of these and use of these biologics, obviously none is perfect and we don't have that uh, autograph is the only one that has all three uh, characteristics. But there's been development of second generation of osteobiologics, and there are small molecules similar to BMP, then bioactive scaffolds that we will cover shortly, and then cellular isle grafts. I'm not sure that they are really second generation of uh, BMA, uh, but they are a mix of osteoconductivity and osteogenicity. So definitely something between, we could say, BMA synthetic and DBM. So we uh, covered that each osteobiologic ideally has to have all three features and that ideally, even if we combine few osteobiologics, we will reach that and we should reach 100% uh, spinal fusion. Well, the problem is that bone is a living tissue and there are constantly changes with the bone and bone remodeling. So we have to consider that. And also there are different types of cells in the host bone, but also in the, uh, the graft material that is delivered into the fusion bed. So that is very important to understand that play. And just by adding different biologics, it's not an exponential that the fusion uh, rate is gonna increase. Actually studies have shown that um, bone remodeling and fusion is non-linear system behavior. So we really have to consider all of that. And the main drivers of bone fusion um, cells, uh, either progenitor cells like stem cells and osteoblasts, they also have shelf life. So when we just look at the stem cells, which are really important in the host bone, but also within the second generation of osteobiologics, uh, cell-based osteobiologics, this graph shows how the number of viable stem cell decreases with age. 
And not only that their number it decreases with age, but also their proliferation, differentiation, and migration decrease, which is really important to carry that fusion process. So that is something that we have to think of when we think about which graph material to use or even uh, improving graph materials and creating next generation. So where do we stand with uh, various osteobiologics? So BMP, heavily used, and um, the, there, there is a lot of literature, uh, lots of evidence, and um, it gets confusing sometimes. Um, but the most recent development is, are the studies then uh, looking at P-leaf and T-leaf, their dosing studies. And uh, really the aim of these studies is to assess the efficacy, safety, and costs. So the, one of the studies, uh, PLF, I apologize, I said P-leaf, PLF, uh, it's Medtronic study. This is the, from clinicalcost.gov. Uh, in this study, they anticipate to enroll 120 patients over seven years. The end date is 2024, end of 2024. And what in this study, uh, it's a multi-level PLF procedure. They have uh, four groups, three are experimental groups where different uh, concentrations of BMP will be tested from 4.2 to 12 milligrams together with the local bone autograph and posterior fixation. And the comparator group will be metronic BM with bone autographed and ilia crest if needed. The second study out there in this bone initiative is T-leaf, one or two levels with the capstone system. And here they're testing two, uh, the plan is to enroll 1,017 patients uh, and the uh, end estimated study end date is 2025, June of 2025. And in this study, they will look at two concentrations, 2.1, which is lower than in PLF, 4.2, again, with the local bone and cancellous allograft if needed. And then the control will be the local autograft as supplemented with cancellous allograft. So will be interesting to see the outcomes, especially with 1,017 patients, if they achieve the goal. And hopefully both studies have randomization. So patient randomization for age comorbidities will be really crucial in this type of a study given that the local bone is given in every uh, group. So when we, as we said, BMP is used a lot. Uh, some people worry about uh, tumor risk, other complications and costs. So there was a need for uh, BMP. Many felt that there is a need for BMP replacement biologics. And uh, some of the small molecules that have been primarily uh, explored in vitro or in animal models are listed here. And they go from nanofibers to peptides, um, oxysterols, uh, or um, small uh, proteins. The only one that uh, has clinical evidence is the I factor, which is a 15 amino acid peptide on an organic bone matrix. So when uh, we look at the evidence for the I factor, there are several studies that are published. The one study looked at ALIF, another one in ACDF, and had a follow-up at 24 months that was published. And the most recent one is non-instrumented PLF. So just to quickly have a look at the most recent, it was published in the Spine Journal a few months ago. They had two groups in this study uh, with 49 patients. Uh, patients in each group received either allograft with autograft or P15 with autograft. These were elderly uh, patients and mainly female, but they had similar pre-op uh, PROs and uh, the distribution of risk factors. These are the surgical stats, uh, very similar again between the two groups. As you can see from the p-value, no really significant difference. Length of stay, uh, length of surgery, blood loss, similar graft volumes of autograft that is used. And then when we look at the distribution of single and two levels, uh, the P15 had more two-level patients than allograft and vice versa. So then when, they, when it comes at 24 months, they, both groups had very, very similar improvements in several PROs. Uh, when it comes to fusion, what the study investigators did, they looked at one level fusion separate and then looked at two level fusions. And they basically looked at every, both left and right side of the fusion. So 
the number 70 doesn't represent 70 patients, but uh, 70 sites, 35. So, uh, and the same goes for the two level fusion. So what from this table we can see is that P15 group uh, ha had higher fusion rates in both single and two level uh, than allograft uh, with at autograft. One thing that um, I would like to see uh, personally would be how many patients actually had fusion because in this study the fusion was considered as long as one site fused. So the 41% is just the number of fusion sites. So for small molecules, just very quickly, this is one of the studies we've uh, worked with a group uh, from UCLA on oxysterols and they have similar mode of action like BMP so this was an animal study two level PLF model where we uh, fused and used um, either BMP in two in a low and high concentration, a mix of oxysterol and BMP uh, and uh, oxysterol alone, again, in a high and low concentration. The, and the fusion rates were very similar between BMP group combos and the oxysterol alone. Uh, this here represents histology. One of the things with BMP is that BMP can induce um, adipogenesis, which we don't definitely want into the fusion uh, site bone of our patients. So this looked at staining, looked really at adipocytes and uh, unfortunately zoom is not sufficient, but basically all these uh, spaces here are um, where adipocytes were. So when it gets brighter, that means that there were more adipocytes just from looking at the images, but we also, uh, count, one of our team members counted the number of adipocytes. So what you can see here, that with oxysterol alone, even with the higher concentration, uh, we had uh, there were less adipocytes than in two BMP groups or uh, in the combination. Um, so that is for the small molecules. Synthetics are osteoconductive, as we mentioned before, hydroxyapatite, BTCP, calcium, uh, sulfates and phosphates been around, used as um, extenders in spinal fusions. Uh, the reason why they are attractive is that they are available in large amounts and uh, in ex relatively inexpensive. How they, however, their resorption is very fast and they are brittle. So there is a lot of literature where different synthetics have been used with autograft, allografts. And um, our group actually a few years ago did a systematic review where we looked and compared synthetic bones, uh, so synthetics to autografts and allografts in cervical and lumbar fusion. And unfortunately, we don't have time to go through the review, but the conclusion was that unfortunately, really uh, to say if synthetics stand a chance alone was low or insufficient, mainly because of the high uh, level of bias and also small sample size across the studies. So uh, the attention when it comes to synthetics in the past several years was towards those bioactive synthetics. And people usually say that bioactive synthetics not only are osteoconductive, but are also osteoinductive. That's not the case because in bioactive synthetics, there are no cells or proteins. So they really, it's all about the chemistry. So they undergo a change to simulate a beneficial response. And um, the most commonly used, and there is very limited clinical evidence, it's all basic science. So the most commonly used are bioactive glass and silicate calcium phosphate based uh, synthetics. And they have shown to have a higher mechanical strength with that chemistry play. Uh, they can induce um, cell um, differentiation and also attract cells. But what some of the, again, basic science studies have shown is that with the different chemical elements, uh, they can also enhance antimicrobial microbial properties of a graft, which is very important when we think about the infection and also uh, increase vascularization, vascularization potential, which we need during bone formation. So definitely very early stages. DBM been around it's used uh, a lot in spine surgery. There are different types of DBMs, um, different uh, shapes and forms. It's osteoconductive. In the past years, there were a lot of improvements in the delivery and structure, especially a lot to lot differences. As we know, there is a lot of literature showing the inconsistencies. And then also carrier and chemistry, because as we know, 
very often not only one biologic is used uh, for spinal fusion, but several of them. And again, our team did a study uh, where we looked at systematic review. We looked at allograft versus DBM in instrumented and non-instrumented lumbar fusion. Started just quickly, 692 patients ended up with studies that really met the inclusion and exclusion criteria 17. Uh, the findings were that for instrumented fusion, DBM did very similarly to allograft. In non-instrumented, DBM did a bit better, but there was a large variation in type of uh, lumbar procedures, or outcomes that were collected, how fusion was graded, lack of control groups, and the sample size. So definitely, we see this trend that we are lacking evidence of uh, studies that um, have all the uh, uh, elements for a good study design. And this just recently got published in the Global Spine Journal. They compared the DBM to uh, BMP2. And this was in instrumented lumbar fusion. It was a PLF. And then with or without P leaf or T leaf, these are just uh, demographics of both groups. You can see that most of the DBM patients got a T leaf. Um, and uh, that at least no, that six patients got a T-leaf and seven in the BMP group got a P-leaf or a T-leaf. Uh, all the other demographics were very similar. They also looked at the costs. Uh, obviously, the cost of the DBM was uh, less than a half what uh, BMP2 had. So when they looked at the fusion, um, they looked at the fusion a few ways, CT, x-rays, and also they uh, went uh, at 12 and 24 months. And obviously BMP had a higher fusion rates uh, than DBM. At the same time in 33% of the patients, uh, BMP group had uh, fusion at the adjacent level. Um, so, and the study team admitted that they didn't look, uh, that their timeline didn't allow for looking at non-union and few other post-operative uh, complications. So I would just like, like to quickly close with cell-based biologics, which are a combo of cells are preserved within that uh, cadaver bone. Um, and they've been very popular in the past few years. And this uh, reviews cover and colleagues looked at different types. It's a super busy table, but what I would like you just to look, have a look is at the donor age. You see the variation or it's not reported. And also at the total cell concentration, as well as the MSC concentration, there is a high variability. So our group uh, did uh, looked at actually allogenic stem cells and we looked at all the questions, is it safe? Are they effective as other biologics? What are the costs? And we looked at both lumbar and the cervical. And as you can see, we started with 382 articles, ended up with 11, six in lumbar and five in the cervical spine. These were the most common not the most common, but the osteobiologics used in the study with osteocell and trinity evolution being the most common. Um, the final uh, conclusion when it comes to all the four questions was that the evidence of effic efficacy and safety of allogenic stem cells in both cervical and lumbar was very low and that it was really hard um, for us. We had little confidence that the effects are seen are reflective of the true effects based on the what uh, the study design provided. So very excited, the last 10 seconds, um, our knowledge forum has developed uh, osteobiologics classification. Every osteobiologic will be classified based on the evidence. There are three levels of evidence, human, uh, animal, and in vitro studies. A1 will be the highest grade, and here is how the classification looks like. Uh, so starting with uh, RCTs and then moving down prospective retrospective studies. And we hope that this will unify uh, clinical research and also industry uh, groups together to work towards improving uh, osteobiologics, but also the use in helping obviously uh, patient reported outcomes. This is the second part of the uh, our classification and we are in the process of uh, validation. So in conclusion, we have a lot of osteobiologics, they have a great potential, but we really need more uh, well-defined clinical studies to justify this widespread use. And it really gets tough to understand what one biologic does when it's mixed with two more. So 
at the end of the day, the way I look at the value of osteobiologic is really we have to compare the costs versus the outcomes over time. And with that, I would like to thank you all. Thanks, Sorry, that was great. A um, Couple more things before I move on to questions for a couple of minutes here. I just wanna remind everybody that our next presentation is gonna be on November 10th, which is a Tuesday. Uh, we're gonna have Dr. Wong and Dr. Chang review imaging studies. Um, choosing the appropriate imaging as well as uh, review of spine imaging for the nine spine provider. Um, so it's a great talk from two um, very brilliant people about their experiences in uh, imaging. I uh, also want to mention really quick and just share my screen one last time um, is the uh, our hopefully to be there um, Spine Symposium, which is due to be in Hawaii in 2021. Um, we'll see if that actually happens. I'm having my fingers crossed because I would love to get uh, a trip out there. I've never been. I'm an East Coast guy and going to Hawaii was never an option for me. So now hopefully we'll be able to get a chance to go. Uh, we had one question here, um, which was a really, really great question. Um, it was looking at BMAC versus PRP and what really uh, presents the better choice. Um, when you look at efficacy, they're actually pretty much equivalent. But when you take in all the other factors, such as cost, uh, availability, obtainment, procurement of the stem cells, um, I, the PRP edges out the BMAC as far as an option. Um, you know, if the outcomes are going to be the same, wouldn't you rather just have a blood draw than a posterior iliac crest bone biopsy, essentially? Um, and then the cost of uh, the kits to process bone marrow is quite a bit more than the PRP. Uh, traditional PRP kit was roughly anywhere between two to three hundred dollars with the centrifuge. Some of the BMAC kits are over a thousand dollars, and that cost will certainly get translated and transferred onto patients. There are multiple hospitals in the, um, not in this area, but in my experience, it charges, you know, tens of thousands of dollars for a stem cell procedure where a much cheaper PRP, much easier to obtain PRP, would maybe give equivocal results based on the clinical evidence out there. Um, there was also a question on NSAIDs in the chat about an acute injury. You know, I think when you're talking about an acute musculoskeletal injury, whether it be tendinous or ligamentous, I think a couple of days of NSAIDs is not contraindicated by any means, um, at least for the simple fact that you get some pain relief to induce some mobility and to promote uh, that functional improvement the first couple of days. We're not talking about taking NSAIDs for a long period of time, but the utility of NSAIDs certainly is still there uh, initially, just not in the post-PRP, post-regenerative treatment um, paradigm. There is a recent rheumatologic uh, article that was published, I believe, last year, and I don't have the exact uh, reference for you, but it did show possible slowing of remodeling in kids with fractures and taking NSAIDs. Um, so take that with a grain of salt that hasn't been really backed up, but there's been some uh, literature released on that. Um, any other questions, any worries or concerns, anybody like to add anything before we sign off here? It's 601, so we're almost right on time. Um, but uh, if anybody has uh, anything else that they want to ask, it's uh, now or maybe next time when you join us for the webinar next month with Dr. Wong and Dr. Chang. Um, and three, two, one, sold. So I wish everybody a good night. Uh, please feel free to reach out. Um, my email is gene.techmeister at med.usc.edu. Um, I'm going to put that in the chat box if you guys want to copy that really quick. Uh, if you have any questions, want to reach out or um, want to discuss anything that you've seen here today, um, you know, please feel free to communicate. And uh, I hope you guys uh, have a safe and um, well Thursday, Friday weekend and uh, stay safe and be alive, everybody. Zori, thank you very much for participating. It's always a pleasure hearing you speak. And thank you to the Spine Center for allowing us to put this webinar on. Have a great day, everybody. Yeah. Bye -bye. Thank you all. Good night.